Welcome to everyone, wherever you're calling, wherever you're coming to us from around the world. My name is Mark Ritchie, and I'm the president of Global Minnesota, and we're pleased to bring you this program today as part of our new and I think very exciting program called our Global Book Club, where we will be bringing stories and experiences from people from around the world. Our opportunity today is uh, brought to you, everyone everywhere, first to the generosity of our members. Thank you to all of our members who through your support were able to have free programming on global issues, on international affairs offered worldwide, with especially with a focus today on a very, very beautifully written book by our guest today, our author and our book today, The Heartbeat of Iran. You'll be hearing from our author in a few moments, but I wanna thank our special partners from today, Majors and Quinn, those of you who know the Twin Cities know we have these fantastic uh, booksellers, Majors and Quinn, and we're so thrilled to have you as our partner today and Team Women, a professional organization of women who are helping to bring a next generation of young leaders into our community and to the world. And we are so fortunate to have Katie Burke, the executive director, who's our partner on things like this and many other things to do a special introduction of our author today. This is one of the ways that Global Minnesota has for nearly 70 years now, been working to bring Minnesotans to connect to the world and the world to Minnesota. Thanks to the miracle of Zoom and the digital tools and platforms we have, we're now able to bring in guests like Tara, who happens to be in Italy today, but to connect Tara to those of us in Minnesota and those who are Minnesotans scattered around the world. And so today we'll have a special opportunity. Uh, your questions we can receive if you wanna send us an email to questions at globalminnesota.org. And we'll be taking those questions um, uh, throughout this next hour. But I wanna welcome our special friend and partner, Katie Burke, Executive Director of Team Women to introduce our very special author guest today. Katie, take it away. Mark, thank you so much for having us here today. We love partnering with Global Minnesota and offering fabulous programming to our, our extended community through this collaboration. And I'm excited to introduce um, all of us here gathered here today to award-winning journalist Tara Kangaroo, who's going to discuss her recently book, as you mentioned, The Heartbeat of um, Iran. And Tara, in this book, she really captures the heart and soul of a country that's often seen through news headlines and political fog that blurs the reality of life for millions of Iranians inside the country. Each chapter in this book is incredibly nuanced, textured, and provides an intimate journey into the diversity of beliefs, struggles, and complexities of life in today's Iran. And they're all told through real stories of its people. So I'm excited to hear you talk to her today, Mark. Um, Tara was born in and raised in Tehran, and she's fully bilingual in English and also Farsi. She's got a bachelor's degree in English from the UCLA and also a master's in journalism from USC. She lives now currently, even though she's in Milan today, she lives currently between London and New York. And, uh, but her career path has been fabulous. It's included time at, spent uh, in opportunities with NBC LA, with CNN, with Al Jazeera America, and in the Middle East, covering the ongoing Syrian conflict, and in particular, Syrian refugee crisis and the MENA region at large. In addition to this huge career uh, and busy career, she's founded The Art of Hope, which is the first U.S. nonprofit that's strictly focused on providing mental health support and trauma relief among war-torn Syrian refugees and vulnerable host communities in Le Lebanon. So please, all of us, join 
join together and welcome Tara Kangerloo. Thank you, away, Katie, and, and welcome, Tara. And um, thank you for taking the part of your life that it took to write this very amazing book. And I want to uh, I want to start with something that is why I suggest to so many of our friends that they buy your book or get it on Kindle or borrow it from, you know, uh, Libby and the various apps that are out there. Uh, you have brought to life the lives of people in very a very special way. You've constructed this book around these stories. And I, I'd just like to open our conversation with asking you, how did you come to this approach to bring to life to others uh, this amazing look inside of the, the whole of the peoples of Iran. So Tara, I think you're still me. There we go. Great. Yes, no, no, of course. Thank you so much, Mark and Katie. Thank you for having me. Thank you to everyone at Global Minnesota and, and all of the viewers for joining us from Minnesota and of course around the US and hopefully from around the world. I'm really thrilled to be with you all. And, and Katie, thank you so much for that kind and generous introduction and to you, Mark, um, for, for the opportunity to be with you all. Um, you know, I consider myself, um, you know, an American journalist, but, but, but I do still consider myself as Iranian as I'm American. And, you know, having been uh, born and raised in Iran, but then spend the rest of my life in the U.S., I, I always um, found myself trying to find similarities, you know, between the way I grew up or my background in Iran with my American friends, American counterparts and colleagues. And, and quite frankly, I realized that we as people of, of these two very different countries have so much more in common than, than what we think or are told through the news or you know, the stories that we read and hear. Um, and, and those similarities have to be shared and talked about and discussed. And, and again, as a journalist, uh, you know, there's nothing more important than capturing human stories and human voices and, and um, issues that pertain to people, wherever they're from. And so for me, it was so incredible, uh, incredibly important, I should say, to capture these people's stories of Iranians, ordinary Iranians from different walks of life, whose uh, passions and hopes and dreams and aspirations and fears and, and, and just you know day-to-day -day, uh, lives are so much more similar with those of us in the US or, or you know, elsewhere in the world than, than what people think. And in these similarities and commonalities, I think we, we may find uh, uh, ground to connect and, and move beyond hostility and sort of you know, political um, you know, semantics. So uh, that's really why I, I decided to spend four years writing this book. And we could talk about that, um, the process of it, but it was, it was truly important to me because um, because it was a country and society that I that I know so well, and and human stories are are often forgotten uh, when it comes to discussions uh, on Iran. Well, I found myself in all the chapters finding things that <laughs> seem familiar or very different, but I have to say I was really l lighting up with your story of the automobile racer. The young woman whose family supported her to do something that people didn't necessarily think was the right thing. And mm -hmm. she could describe in her words through you what I felt like at 16 when one of my friends was making it as a drag racing uh, sports car driver in my little tiny hometown out on the prairie. and the, the Indy 500 I got to go to with my friend whose dad had the Chevy dealer. So there was something about that story that lit up a part of me mm -hmm. that I've left behind, but is always there. And so a good writer and a story told as you did can remind us of ourselves and then give us an opportunity to connect that part of ourselves with somebody from another culture, from an, mm. another society. So thank you for reminding me that there were 
many moments and still today when her ambition and she's very successful now um you know was something to be dreaming about to aspire to were there parts of those stories that touched pieces of you that you go oh i wanted to be an automobile racer or mm-hmm. something else Mark, that's such a beautiful point you raised. I think, like you said, as as different as, you know, people are in the U.S. from, you know, folks in Iran, these similarities exist. These commonalities are so universal, you know, dreaming toward a goal, um, envisioning a mission that you want to achieve despite the challenges and obstacles, no matter which society you live in, right? I mean, for for example, in the book, um, I have two stories about, you know, two members of the LGBTQ community that I think in the U.S. folks can, can perhaps... Uh, resonate with because, you know, each state is different, each community is different. So the level of conservatism and, and liberalism, um, you know, varies with each city and community and, and you know, town. And that's something so similar to what folks go through in Iran. But back to your question, I think for me, um, I think I always wanted to, wanted to be a storyteller. You know, I always wanted to be a poet, actually. So um, I, I, I used to write uh, poetry in Farsi uh, when I was growing up, um, and 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 you know I guess I didn't pursue that. But but for me, I always wanted to tell stories. And and when I moved to the states as a teenager, you know, I was 16, 17. I always found myself trying to tell stories of where I came from, you know, trying to make the case of why I belong to this new community or what I have similar with my American classmates. And I remember, I'll share this story with you, Mark. I remember uh, when we moved to the States, uh, by the way, I have to say that my parents moved to the States, you know, in the 60s and, you know, I, I was born an American citizen. So, you know, I, 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 you know, my family deliberately choose to come, you know, my, my family didn't leave during the revolution and so on. So it was a very, um, you know, uh, uh, deliberate choice. Um, so I remember I, I enrolled in a, um, a uh, Seventh-day Adventist high school, a very conservative, you know, community. And I remember my first class was um, a Bible class. And again, bear in mind that I'm coming from Tehran, um, a, 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 you know, a, a, the society in Iran, um, you know, has girls go to girls' school, boys to boys' school, and, you know, you have Quran and religious classes. And I remember in that Bible class, the first thing that came to my mind is that, gosh, you know, these Americans are also super religious. Oh, this is so interesting. So I suppose it's okay if I want to explain, you know, my schooling or, you know, things that I learned in school. And... I suppose, I suppose it's not too bad to be religious because again, growing in a secular family, you know, we, we didn't necessarily uh, support the government, right? Who wants to shove these religious narratives in your throat. So we were, you know, pretty secular, but then here I am in the U S with a bunch of super religious people. So, so, you know, in these similarities, I, I, I try to tell my own story. And I think all of that, were catalysts to me pursuing journalism. So I, 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 I'm sorry to disappoint. I didn't want to be a race car driver. I always wanted to be a storyteller <laughs> and a poet. So, and then, you know, I pursued journalism, but I always remember that Bible class because it was just so surprising, you know, that, oh my goodness, religion is not just a political thing. People actually care about, you know, their faith. Oh yeah. Well, Persia has poets, over thousands of years. <laughs> Have you had the opportunity to appreciate and share the poets in your background that way and then derive some inspiration from that? Absolutely. Actually, um, uh, you know, uh, coming back to the book, I want to um, I want to answer your question in the framework of this book, which, which I think um, reflects on my love for Persian literature and poetry. Uh, for folks who uh, may not know about the book yet, or are just hearing about it, or may have not read it, the book is a collection, you know, The Heartbeat of Iran is a collection of 24 intimate stories of ordinary and some extraordinary Iranians who are living inside the country right now from different walks of life, backgrounds, uh, religious beliefs, uh, financial backgrounds, and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and, 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 and Mark, if so many folks who've read the book um, tell me that, you know, this is Iran within Iran 
within Iran, because in each story, you know, you don't, you don't get to just hear that person's journey or tale, but rather you get layers and layers of culture, politics, social issues, um, and, and, you know, diversity of beliefs and, and religions and ethnicities and so on. Um, so back to literature, I knew I want to um, tackle that, you know, I knew I want to tackle Persian literature and poetry and art. And the way I did that is through the chapters, through the, 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 the few chapters, I tried to pull these elements, you know, um, for example, I, I, I knew I want to talk about um, Iran's rich calligraphy, right? And in the story of Khadi Kuiki, this mm -hmm. beautiful chapter, it's actually one of my favorite stories. Um, he's, he's an artist, who hails from this small town uh, that borders uh, Iraq. And, and he recalls how the reed fields were an inspiration to his painting and, and how he saw so much um, of his childhood growing up in this small town that was later um, destroyed in many ways during the Iran-Iraq war in, in his art and and the poetry that he uses are the poetry of Hafez and Sadi and, and Rumi, you know, great Persian poets of, you know, 12th, 13th, 14th century. And and um, and I infuse all of this into his story. I mean, the story of his artist, but I pull out these historic anecdotes. And, um, and then in another um, story, again, completely different world, it's a story of this homeless, um, drug addict who I think a lot of his struggles mirrors that of so many folks, you know, dealing with addiction worldwide. But 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 I unpack his um, his passion for poetry and modern poetry, and I talk about the profound works of uh, folks like Sham Lu and uh, the the uh, writings of Sadiq Hedayat who um, was one of the most well-regarded modern or contemporary writers. Uh, he, he was part of you know, the literati movement of, um, of the late 30s, 40s, uh, and, uh, and he committed suicide in Paris. Anyway, so his story is so interesting. But to answer your question, I try to touch on different literary and poetic figures through these chapters and through the stories of these people and also tr uh, show my readers the art and the depth of literature and poetry of, of this 3000 year old uh, civilization really. And I found that chapter of the young man who was addicted back and forth mm. was also an intergenerational chapter yeah. and both father and son with this struggle. and. Was there an element of heartbreak in that and other of the chapters? So many of them are, you know, revving up a big Corvette engine and things like that. But there were <laughs> chapters that were hard and grief in its most profound way. How, how was that for you? Absolutely. And, and again, for folks um, who may have not yet uh, read the book, you know, it's, uh, it's not a rosy take on Iran. It's not a romanticized take on Iran. Mark, you read it. I mean, the stories are, are real um, anecdotes and journeys of, of ordinary people. You know, some are hopeful, some are heartfelt and, and beautiful and light, but some are incredibly heavy and daunting and, 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 um, and sad. Um, but I think in all of them, what, what's universal is that person or that individual's passion for life, you know, this, this, this innate resilience to move forward in, in this complex society and this country that's faced with so many challenges. So the heartbreaks were there, Mark. I have to say, I mean, I, you know, like I said, I, I, I spent about three, three years interviewing folks, um, you know, over the phone, WhatsApp. FaceTime, you know, whatnot, and, 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 and have conversations that took hours and hours and hours and hours. And I think in each interview and in each story, I, I realized a few things. One, that these people want to belong to the international community. They want to have their stories heard. They want their voice to, to be shared with, with, you know, their counterparts around the world. But also the second thing that, that struck me after each story was the talents and potential and, um, 
and uh, uh, and capacity that exists in this country, you know, among the youth, among the people, but also the older generation, that if this capacity and potential is met, I mean, the, 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 the society can not only get out of, of, of this sort of economic and political abyss that they're facing, but also be a contributor to the region and the world. Um, so yes, some stories are quite heavy, um, but, but I think in all of them, I, I found an element of hope. Um, it, 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 I don't know if you did, but, but for me, there was always this element of hope. They, they somehow managed to, to, to move forward. And I think that's, a, that's an ever present element in Iran, in, in everyday life in Iran, is that people find ways to maneuver, people find ways to, to live and move forward despite all the challenges that exist. Well, I was struck by that aspect of all, and I was noticing really maybe by the second or third, because these chapters are long and deep and have many complexities, but I was in my mind realizing, oh, these are all folks who stayed in Iran. Mm -hmm. And that's a common element that has probably some political meaning, social meaning, cultural meaning, definitely rooted family, it has meaning. So your family left, but you connected back in a way like family with people. I mean, you had to gain a level of trust to have stories told in the way that you wrote it about them and reported them. How did that part, part feel in this, uh, the writing, you know, as you as an author, you as a storytelling writer? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, a little bit about my family. Like I said, you know, my parents uh, moved to the States in the 60s, in the late 60s, early 70s. My dad was a, was a physician, but then after the revolution, um, and I think I believe it was during the Iran-Iraq war, um, they went back because my grandfather got sick and, you know, dad wanted to be uh, to be, you know, with with his family, and um, and he stayed in Iran until he he passed in 2011, and he was he was a very well regarded um, oral surgeon, and so, um, you know, he's an example of of a man, you know, the the sort of uh, the generation that. Um, you know, do not support the government, does not, or if he was alive, he would not support the government, but, but a generation that, you know, stayed and lived and worked in that country and, you know, uh, just, just d d d detached itself from politics, you know, being a doctor, you don't necessarily have, you know, you, you don't deal with the political establishment, but, but, not, but, but at the same time, it doesn't prevent you from being frustrated with, with the day-to-day day -day challenges. And, and there's so many people like my father who um, can leave but chose to stay, you know, who chose to go back. And, and young folks who, of course, some have left and many continue to leave. In fact, I, I, I've written re pieces on this, you know, talking about the brain drain of, of Iran, but some have decided to stay in this country and there are reasons for that. And, and, um, and you know, talking about my connection to Iran, you know, I, I never wanted to give up my Iranian heritage and identity to become someone else. You know, I'm I'm a proud American. I'm I'm proud of my my American culture and and um you know I, I learned so much from you know this country and 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 I cherish it, but at the same time that doesn't make me want to give up on so much that 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 I carry with me as an Iranian woman, right? Um, I do consider myself an American journalist because, you know, I, I never worked for Iran or in Iran. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably not welcome to go back to Iran because, you know, I'm regarded as, you know, an American journalist, dual citizen, and so on. But also that didn't prevent me from wanting to tell these stories because I fundamentally believe that, um, you know, the narrative on Iran in the U.S. is incredibly insular and narrow and, and strictly covers politics. The nuclear talk, you know, a bunch of crazy uh, politicians who no one can pronounce their last names. And, you know, the, the history of Iran for many Americans, unfortunately, starts in 1979. And, and that's it, right? Then it's the hostage crisis and, 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 and so on. But to me, knowing both countries 
I realized that the need to tell these human stories, because fundamentally, Iran is a country of 80 million human beings, not 80 million centrifuges and nuclear heads. And that distinction needs to be made. You know, Iranian people are separate from their government, but their stories never get told. And I think if, if their stories are not told, therefore the world won't, won't care about them because they, they, they don't regard them as human. And, and so in ways, I think what the book does, it, it humanizes Iran, right? And, and takes away from this militarized image that you know, folks in the US have of this nation of 80 million. Well, and 3,000 years of recorded civilization and recorded in various ways, culture captured in art or poetry or pottery or in you know various forms. And um, I know for me, this was one element that not all of the chapters, but some of the chapters did touch on the what it means to be a 3,000 year old mm. uh, civilization. My friends from Asia talk about being 5,000 year old, you know, Japan and China and Korea. Um, but this aspect, which is trying to connect, has in my reading of the book the purpose of both understanding in its, um, let's say, shallow understanding but has the deeper understanding as its goal, the part where the heart comes to understand difference, similarities, acceptance. There'll always mm -hmm. be differences. With our kids, there's differences. <laughs> with our spouses, there are differences. With our neighbor, but it's the understanding that allows us then to appreciate and go on. Have you found your colleagues or friends or just random people who also have a Persian background or, or from Iran now or some other generation loving this book and loving talking to you? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm so flattered and I'm humbled really um, because I think uh, when I hear their, their positive feedbacks, it makes me think that it was a worthwhile journey. You know, this was this to me was a personal project. It was something that was was important and necessary uh, because you know if you go to a bookstore and and go to the Iran section, unfortunately, you would uh, most likely find books with uh, with an image of an ayatollah on the cover or something to do with a hostage crisis or some super heavy thick history books or and, and you know some memoirs that are that are quite special. Um, but there are very few books and, and pieces of, of work that truly take our audience and readers um, in the West into the heart and soul and, and diversities and nuances of this uh, very complex society and, and, and allow them to see the isms and, and uh, layers of, 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 of life that make this, this country um, you know, tick today really and, and, and move forward. Um, and so the feedback, quite frankly, with from the Iranians in the US and, you know, Europe, it's been mainly thank you. Thank you for doing this, you know, because it's, it's, it's humanizing Iran. And again, I go back to this point about, you know, for many people, Iran is extremely militarized because all we hear about is, you know, the nuclear talk, the missile program, you know, human rights issues and all that. We never hear about the people. We never hear about, you know, the stories of ordinary Iranians. And, and the, 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 those stories often appear in, in forms of protest. And, 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 you know, I asked myself, uh, not just about Iran, by the way, but anywhere in the, in the region is that, you know, the world will care about protests if they care about the people, right? And the issues affecting them. And how can we make the world care about Iranians and Iran and people in Iran? By, by letting them know each other, by letting them see them, right? And, and understand their commonalities. And, and so that's, um, you know, I hear the word thank you, which, which makes me really happy. Um, and quite frankly, it's, it's, it's also important for me, for folks in the US to, 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 to gain new perspectives on Iranians, not just in Iran, but those who, who live in the US. And I shared this anecdote with you, Mark, a friend of mine, um, she's a green card holder. 
you know, she, she was um, applying for, to be a flight attendant at, at one of the, you know, bigger US um, airlines. And I think she was in the last stage of her interview process. And, and she, she called me, she said, Tara, I'm a bit nervous because I feel at any moment they're gonna, you know, kick me out of the program or, or don't hire me because I, I have my Iranian passport. You know, because uh, they're going to say, oh, you know, she's Iranian terrorist. You know, you never know. And, and the idea that a young green card holder, a young woman in the U.S. who has worked so hard to be where she is, has to fear this, this paranoia simply because of the misconceptions that exist toward her country, that's unfair. And, and, and even I face that. I mean, I remember when the book came out, it was June 1st, I was flying from Chicago to New York and I went to the airport in Chicago and I went to the, you know, young woman at, at the, you know, the, the bookshop and I, and I said, do you have a copy of the heartbeat of Iran? And she said, heartbeat of where? And I said, Iran. And I, and I thought to myself, come on, be proud, say that word. You know, it, Iran is not only the, the Ayatollah or angry clerics and oppression. Iran is so much more. Iran is, is, is its people. And that's really what I tried to do with the book. Um, and so the feedback has, has so far been positive and I'm, and I'm really grateful. And I, and I can't wait for your audience and everyone there to, to read it and, and, um, and see Iran beyond the headlines. Well, I have found myself uh, at times in reading, but especially in our conversation today, of course, reflecting on America. You're defining yourself as American journalist. Uh, America has its own set of shocking images around the world. Minnesota, where I live, and Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, where I live, uh, has had an incredible, uh, you know, worldwide spotlight because of the murder of George Floyd. And so the notion of how we think about ourselves within family, within neighborhood, within community, within communities of interest, within states, within nations, within continents, within planets. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a universal question that maybe we don't tackle often, but sometimes a mirror held up that gives us uh, an image or a window that we peer through that allows us to see something else can give us some reflection that then makes us more open to understanding. No guarantees, lead a horse to water, all of that. But I feel like your book has both the effect of giving somebody like me, a reader, uh, new insights into a people, a diverse and proud and people of thousands of years of cultural history rolling forward, but it also gave me some ways to think also about my country, America, and about my country of origin, Germany. And I'm wondering if you as an American journalist and American through a number of different years of your life and situations, if there's an element of thinking in both cultures simultaneously as you are doing this or talking about it. Oh, 100%, 100%, Mark. I can't agree with you more. And I really appreciate what you said. Um, I, I grew up maneuvering between these two cultures. I grew up maneuvering between uh, life in America and, and you know being an American, but also being an Iranian and, and all the experience I, experiences as I had. And then I, you know, as I grew into my profession, you know, as a journalist, I cover the Middle East and I spend a lot of time in the region. And, uh, and again, I, I find people have so much more in common with one another than, than what's told. And if only we hear those similarities, if only we are trained to, to respect and appreciate those similarities, uh, the world would be a much better place. And, and, um, and quite frankly, it's much easier to do than not. And, and, and the current events and the unfortunate events of the past you know, year or so in the US, um, I think has opened the eyes of, of Americans, especially the young folks, to see beyond 
you know, their community, their city, and their 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 bubble. And and um, and and I think coming from a completely different world, I, I I had no choice but to do that always, if that makes sense. You know, I I always had to compare and contrast in order to fit in, right? Um, but I think people right now in the US, young folks right now are doing that. Um, and and I also, uh, you know, wanna, wanna echo what you said because celebrating your roots and culture will only contribute to your society and, and community, whether it's a small one or a large one. And, and really that's what I, try to do in my work. Um, and I hope that this is a book that, that also um, broadens perspective towards this, uh, this country, but also allows uh, people in the US or Europe or elsewhere to reflect internally and kind of you know, look at where they're standing in the world and, and, and what their story is and how much they have in common with you know, their neighbor or someone who's living thousands of miles away. Well, I was thrilled to see some bits in the book in uh, rural areas and farming and food production and food. Uh, this has been my passion in my life. And of course, you know, it's urbanized societies have, you know, maybe more uh, access to media and to writers. But this was one element uh, mm -hmm. of your book that was something like, I, uh, you know, oh, yeah, that's part of the the society that we live in here in a, another big country like the United States. But I also was so appreciative of the, the, just the sort of range of ordinary, I would say often extraordinary ordinary <laughs> people um, that, um, that you chose. And that, you know, a bit of the reminder of just how complex a, a planet of 8 billion people is gonna be complicated. Mm -hmm. And to think otherwise is to, um, you know, not really appreciate that. And so it seems like there's a universal message of your book about the complexity of life in, in the modern world, um, but you don't preach in any of the chapters about a sort of, and therefore, <laughs> how did you avoid um, <laughs> preaching at the end of some of these chapters or at the back of the book, you know, or something like that. How do you manage that discipline? Because I'm a reporter. <laughs> oh, oh, that. <laughs> I'm a journalist. There's been a little slippage in that particular yeah. profession, perhaps. <laughs> not, so. I'm impressed. Right now. Thank you. Thank you. That's too kind. Um, it was, it's not my story. You know, it's their mm -hmm. story. It's, uh, and I, I happen to tell the story because I know the complexities of that society. Um, I probably would not be able to tell the story, um, you know, the heartbeat of China because, you know, I, I've only been to China when I was five years old. And I think for anyone to be able to expand and open um, any society, any community, any country, they need to live and breathe that nation. They need to live and breathe that society. And I could do that easily with, with, with Iran um, whilst keeping my journalist hat on. I mean, these are their stories and, and, and I didn't want to have a therefore, therefore do that. That's up to you to, to, to choose, to decide. And I think that was my intention. You know, there is no agenda. There's no mission. There's no it's up to you. It's up to you to, to, to look at these stories through the prism of your, um, your life, your outlook, your perspective on, on, on how you want your community to be and your outlook to be. Um, and, I, and I often wonder, um, what would it be like if I were to write a book titled, you know, The Heartbeat of America, The Heartbeat of the U.S.? And, and, I, and I would love to read that book um, because it also talks about, you know, the, the, again, the last point you mentioned is that um, this society has a mirror in the US and anywhere in the world, right? Because it has the ups and downs and complexities and, you know, uh, okay. the many shades that exist between the black and white, right? And I think, you know, in any society between, um, you know, the right and the left and the black and the white, 
the multitude of shades and colors and isms that we just don't see. And, and I think the US is, is, is um, a great example. So um, I don't know, I do wanna read that book, but um, sorry, that was not answering your question, but, 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 but I hope I answered the, the, your well, question. Well, and it leads me <laughs> to another, another question, which is heartbeat is a very specific word. It's the thing that continues life and its absence is the end of life. Mm -hmm. And hearts are complex things. And my own life has been touched by things that have to do with heart transplants and other things. But heartbeat was a choice you made of the word, not the heart of Iran. Well, it's a different subject perhaps, but the heartbeat, the thing that gives and continues life, how did you come <laughs> to that? What happened? Oh, How'd you my get goodness. that? Um, so I did probably 80% of my interviews in Istanbul um, because, you know, the time zone is the same with, with Iran uh, most of the time. And, um, and I was speaking with a friend of mine uh, who's also Iranian. She's been in the music business for a long time. And we were talking about the title of the book. And, we, and I kept talking about how it's about the people and it's about how people are different than the government and, and how they give life. And, and we kept thinking, okay, what gives life? What is the heart, the heartbeat? And so that's how it came about. But if you allow me, um, if that's okay, I would read um, maybe one, this very short Please. paragraph if we have time, if that's okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. Because, ma because I think time. this would answer your question. <laughs> time, we have thousands of years, of course. Oh, thank you. I would, um, I do want to read this last part. Um, Okay, because I because I think it answers um, your question, and I hope it does. Um, okay, all right. <clears throat> and this is just the introduction, so there's no spoilers. I'm not, you know, uh, revealing anything. <laughs> it would be uh, impossible to spoil <laughs> any this book. Let me say, let me just Thank say you. that out loud. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, here it goes. As I finish writing my introduction, I can't help but think of Margaret Atwood's words on how she hopes that people will finally come to realize that there's only one race, the human race, and that we're all members of it. As you read this book, more than anything, I hope you come to understand the values and humanity that you share with the average Iranian, an experience that will enable all of us to see beyond the surface, beyond the political headlines, and beyond the dark shadows of hostile governments. In doing so, you're already creating a path for discourse, dialogue, and engagement, all necessary ingredients for any form of progress, peace building, and change. Inherently, when people recognize their similarities, they become more tolerant and understanding of one another. And when you finish this book, I hope you remember that it's the people of a nation who define their country, their values, and their history. By now, some of the people I've featured in the book may have left Iran, some may have changed careers, and some may have even died. But one, will, one thing will remain, and that is, or was, their passion for life. Governments come and go, presidents change, regimes collapse, but what will forever remain is the pulse of the people who pump blood into the veins of their land. People who, in this case, are the heartbeat of Iran. <laughs> there it is. That gives us this big picture of where you were going. And believe me, I believe you got there. <laughs> but I know that you, having the discipline of a reporter to not say, therefore, in this mm -hmm. book, you wanted the pulse, the heartbeat to be the dynamic. But other things in life have then motivated you to create nonprofits and ways of addressing some other issues. The most important image I have from our last year or so here in Minnesota was the mural of George Floyd on a bombed out side of a building in a little tiny rural village in Syria. 
mm. knowing that what had happened here created a shockwave throughout the planet and a response ripples out and ripples back a response from everywhere somewhere mm -hmm. in there you have found a special place in your life and your heart and addressing mental health and trauma for those affected by that terrible civil war in syria many of our governments are involved both of your countries mm -hmm. and many others tell us how that particular therefore for yourself came to be and how others who might come to share that perception this needs some attention from other humans this needs some pulse some heartbeat mm -hmm. how they could connect with you about this absolutely mark and i really appreciate you bringing up um this and and you know my work with art of hope um you know you 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 know i um you know, I spent some time in Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey, you know, bordering uh, Syria, covering the conflict there since 2014 and, and you know, have reported on the issue from, from various uh, angles and, you know, perspectives and stories. And every story I did somehow uh, made me realize that, that these people are, are severely affected by emotional wounds and trauma and PTSD. And, um, and, and, and those needs are not being addressed. And this is something that stayed with me and, and, and made me, um, you know, led me to, to start my nonprofit Art of Hope in 2016. Um, I mean, we are a small nonprofit um, that I, that I uh, launched simply because the, the issue was not being addressed. And, you know, we, we predominantly work in Lebanon, a country of 6 million with nearly 2 million refugees including 500,000 500, Palestinians who've been there for years. Um, and as you know, uh, Lebanon doesn't have the infrastructure to, to host this many refugees. And, you know, the country, today is actually the anniversary of the, of the tragic, you know, August explosion. Fourth, fourth explosion. Right. And, so, and so for me, you know, as a journalist, um, I had the privilege really to, to see history unfold, uh, but, but it was rather a tragic history. Right. And, and, and the impact of it on, on people was was was, uh, you know, tr traumatic for me, even as a reporter. And so that's when I decided to, um, you know, take my reporter hat off and put the hat of an activist for mental health. Uh, for something that, again, is so apolitical. And, and I talk about this a lot, you know, journalists, Mark, are not activists, okay? Reporters and journalists, we're not activists. That's a, that's a, different, that's a different job. But there are things like mental health, um, you know, using women and children as, as uh, tools in war, um, using sex as, as a war weapon, using, you know, or, or the human trafficking, you know, the, the, the fundamentally inherently wrong things, right? There's no question, you know, no one's going to question whether trafficking is okay or not, or, or you know, the, the, the traumatized child should, should be supported or not, right? So that's why I felt that it's okay for me to use my voice and experience in this form of support and activism for children and, and refugees that are uh, that you know fled war and conflict, as well as the uh, vulnerable host community. And the way we work, Mark, is uh, we uh, partner with local NGOs, local grassroots in Lebanon, young uh, mental health professionals. Who again, you know, themselves are struggling because of you know the host of challenges at home, um, and and help them provide mental health and trauma relief services mainly through art therapy. So that's what we've been doing. I mean, we're a small nonprofit, but very targeted, very curated, and you know, uh, we all work pro bono. Um, this is something that's a passion project of mine. All of our volunteers are pro bono in in the U.S. So we fundraise and you know we we give support to. Um, to folks on the ground. And I have to say that last year after the explosion, we went to the field and this year with COVID, we still managed to support, you know, a small community of 60 kids for a couple of months. Um, so, you know, that's still something, um, but, but we're extremely targeted. And, you know, Mark, quite frankly, um, I wish there was a way I could do this for Iran and, you know, for villages that, that 
that you know may need uh, similar support, um, maybe not to the same extent, but but it really breaks my heart when I when I see U.S. nonprofits and U.S. organizations not being able to directly support Iran uh, because of the sanctions. And even though you know technically uh, humanitarian aid is exempted from sanctions, it in, it in ways is not because you need to have special privileges and licenses and so on. So it's a complex issue and it, it often breaks my heart that, you know, I can't even do that for my own country. But, but again, it's, um, I hope it's a way that I can use my experiences as a reporter to have tangible impact on something so, so, so important, which is mental health. And I think and it, because of the pandemic, we're seeing it more everywhere, really. And is there a website people could get more information? Yes, of course. It's artofhopeglobal.org. Um, my website is tarakangarlu.com. I'm incredibly easy to find. Um, info at tarakangarlu.com. Um, with, so with art of, art yeah. of hope global. Art of hope global. Dot org. Dot org. Dot org. Great, great, great. Well, I um, grew up in a little tiny town in Iowa out on the prairie. And that town had a, a wonderful, pretty large seven-day Adventist community. And um, they have their own schools and some of their own factories, um, some other things. And, um, but one of the young people in my class, we were, you know, small place, but was a seven-day Adventist. And so I got to learn and, you know, appreciated that different culture. It was different culture than the Southern Baptists and Methodists, my upbringing. But a few years ago, one of our most important nonprofits here, um, you know, one that really looked at uh, what we call the blue zones, but looking at, you know, what, what gives people long life? And what's the role of how we live and happiness in particular? And the Seven Day Adventists and that organization have become, you know, in a way kind of merged. And I've just appreciated so much their contributions in different ways to our society. So I was a little taken back by you had this incredible opportunity, maybe as a young person, it was uh, unusual in different ways, but it seemed like um, you landed in the United States in kind of an unusual way. And you've been able to turn a number of unusual things in your life into sharing a storytelling to then give other ordinary people like me and the people who read your book, um, picture uh, a hand, uh, a sense of other ordinary people thousands of miles away. So I want to thank you for coming on our program today and sharing with us a bit of your story, but also the story of the book, the story of the people, the story of your passion project. Hopefully some of our viewers will get involved, but I want to give you the opportunity of a last word. You gave us an incredible insight from the introduction of your book. Maybe there's another part that you want to share, but we still have a few minutes. I want to give that time to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. So kind of you. And, and it's, it's truly humbling, really. I think, you know, writing this book, my work, um, it's, 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 it's very humbling. And, and um, you know, <sighs> I want to share a quote that, um, that has resonated with me more in, in the process of writing this book and also sharing it with the world. Uh, you know, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro, um, Nobel laureate uh, writer, in his, uh, in his uh, actually uh, acceptance speech, he, he said something along the lines that storytelling, uh, you know, has many industries, lucrative industries built around it, you know, the movies, theater, music, even books. But ultimately, storytelling is about one person telling another, this is how I feel. Do you feel that? This is what I see. Do you see that? And in my work as a reporter and journalist and mental health advocate um, and writer right now, I don't think there's anything more profound than us asking ourselves this question, I see it this way, do you see that? 
What is it that you see? And I think if we ask that question more from ourselves and our family, community, and counterparts, um, we're going to have a much easier and, and healthier way uh, forward in life. So um, I look forward to having um, you know your audience read the book and of course get in touch with me and and I absolutely am grateful to yourself and everybody at Global Minnesota for the opportunity I mean how exciting I, I feel I'm in Minnesota right now in you know in spirit yeah, that's, <laughs> we, that's how we see it and I want to remind people Majors and Quinn that fantastic bookseller based here down in my neighborhood actually uh, is one place where you can get that book there it is heartbeat of a rant uh, Katie Burke and all the team at Team Women thank you so much for being part of this um, our next book event actually will be a, a different kind of event where it's a partnership with Norway House um, which is one of our amazing diasporas, and uh, Liv Arneson, who is an explorer, uh, writer, speaker, who um, uh, journeyed across the South Pole with a local Minnesotan. Our, um, you know, our own explorer uh, world here is quite rich and complex, but she wrote a book about her solo trip to the South Pole. And um, her, her partner, Anne Bancroft, uh, in these exp explorations and their earlier books have been fantastic. But her new book, um, Skiing into the Bright Open, um, this was supposed to be in person, her coming over from Oslo. It now has to be Zoom because of the new situation. Yeah. But six o'clock um, uh, in the afternoon, and uh, you can go to the Norway House or to the Global Minnesota website and get more details. Uh, but that'll be a fantastic discussion. And I'll um, uh, have the opportunity to moderate and to ask a lot of questions and um, find out a little more about that. And then remember that next week um, on the 10th at um, 1.30, so it's an unusual time of the day after lunch, um, in partnership with uh, U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, which is our partner in promoting at a national level, uh, international assistance, international engagement, and MEN, Minnesota International NGO Network. Um, we'll have a, a live conversation with Congressman Tom Emmer, who's been one of the most important voices advocating around international aid and support, uh, also was the really central person who moved our bid to host a world expo on health and wellness here in Minnesota through the legislature just a couple of years ago. So Congressman Emmer will be our uh, guest on that program, that USGLC program, the Arneson uh, in our partnership with Norway House. And again, in my last minute, thank you to our members who make these programs possible. For those of you who would like to join us at Global Minnesota as a member, you can go right to our website. Uh, it's that support that makes it possible for us to meet and come to learn from uh, guests like Tara today. She spoke about the speech at the Nobel Laureate and she said the words, here's what I'm feeling what are you feeling? Are you feeling the same? Here's what I'm seeing. Are you seeing the same? These events give us a chance to hear how Tara or other authors and others are feeling, what they're seeing, and a chance for us to see how we're feeling and seeing, and a chance to deepen understanding beyond just knowing a little more about each other, really feeling from our heart from heart to heart, our understanding as Margaret Atwood said, one race, the human race. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Carolina and the team behind the, all the technology that makes this happen. And thank you to our viewers. We'll see you at the next Global Book Club here at Global Minnesota. Bye now. <laughs>